Hey guys, Mike here with StoneCoatCountertops.com. Check out this table surface that we just finished our final coat on. We're going to show you in this video everything we did from raw lumber all the way to our final coat. We took many different species of wood. We didn't even stain them. This is all natural. We're going to show you everything that we did step by step. How to adhere these together, how to create this amazing table surface. Check us out and visit us anytime at StoneCoatCountertops.com. Enjoy the video. Hey guys, Mike here with StoneCoatCountertops.com. Today we're going to take all these different scraps of wood and we're going to make an amazing table. There's a bunch of different species, uh, just purple woods and Jacoby and walnut. We got maple. We got all kinds of great, uh, great species that we're going to laminate together and make a really cool project. We're going to show you how to take our epoxy and cover the surface. We're going to show you how to reinforce this so you don't get cupping and, and movement on this table for the long haul. Stay tuned. All the tips and tricks are right now. First thing what we're going to do is rip this down into two and a quarter strips. Our overall table is going to be two inches thick when we're done. So we're going to give ourselves two and a quarter so, because we know when we, when we bar clamp this together, we're going to have some imperfection. But that's where our slab jig comes into play. We're going to show you how to level this thing to perfection. It's going to be very flat and very true. So first thing I'm going to do is set up the table saw and I'm going to rip this down to two and one quarter inches. Let's get started. Okay, what we're doing is we're working with some wood that is what they call S3S, which is sanded three sides. And some of these are just sanded two sides. And so you have two edges that are just rough sawn from the, the actual mill. And so we're going to put a nice straight edge on one side of these so that we can then measure two and a quarter and cut our pieces accordingly and not have it be wavy down one end. So we're just going to take a nice straight piece of uh, plywood that's already ripped and we're going to shoot this with our 23 gauge pin nail gun. The reason we use 23 gauge nails is because we could snap those off without evidence that you pin nailed it or screwed it or something like that. They come out really easy but they hold just perfectly for a cut like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at this end. I'll start my board. I'm going to get a measurement on that right here. So we know that's about seven inches. We'll come down here. We'll get this at about seven inches. And then we'll see and make sure when we rip this, we just rip enough off to make a nice straight cut. Okay, let's check that now. And we're going to make sure that no part of that cut will be really, see it bows out, which is fine. So our short points are at the end anyways. So I'm going to take off, I'm going to cut it at, instead of seven, we'll go six and seven eighths. That'll cut a nice sliver off of this, but it'll make a really good straight edge for us. So we're just popping this off. Now I got pen nails that are protruding and all I got to do is snap these off. And on real hard wood, trying to pull them out with pliers, sometimes it'll leave them proud and they'll be sticking up and they're like needles. So you just got to be real careful. But if I do this, those are nice and flush. Got one more. We'll pop that off. Perfect. Now I have a really good straight edge on one side of this that we can use and cut as our guide. I'm going to finish doing this stack of lumber and we'll move on to the next step. Okay. 
okay, we got all the boards cut nice and straight. So we put a straight edge on those boards that were just rough sawn. We're gonna finish cutting those all two and a quarter wide. Let's do that right now. Okay, we got everything ripped to a two and a quarter. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut them to length roughly because when we get this all laminated together, it's not gonna be perfect. You'll have pieces that protrude further than the others. We'll take and we'll rip that as one piece, but right now we're just gonna get it close so we're not wasting a bunch of epoxy when we laminate this together. So I just got my simple T-square. We're gonna set that up here. We'll go to our shortest points, which are right here, and I'm just gonna give myself a mark so we can cut this on the uh, chop saw. Now what's nice about our cutoff piece is you can always save your cutoffs and use them on small projects and art projects and different ideas that you have. You can even make a table out of scraps. So we're going to go ahead and cut all these down and we'll start our next step after that. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna plastic the surface off because when we epoxy our, and laminate this table together, we don't want it laminate into our table. So the uh, plastic will act as a barrier between the table and the wood that we're laminating. So what we've done is we've really separated color so that we didn't have any one color uh, taking over a section. We, we tried to spread out the color. I, I love what Mother Nature has done with these different species of wood and how you bring it all together and the beauty found in an unstained finish is, is just crazy. This is going to be such a fun table to laminate together. Uh, we took the time to do this now as opposed to doing it after we've started the epoxy process because then it's going to be a fluid easy system we're going to get it right put together without any worries so we got this set up we're going to go ahead and get some bar clamps ready we'll get our epoxy mixed up and laminate together we'll be right back all right guys we've got this all set up we added a couple more blonde boards we really liked the contrast. What do you think of the contrast, Mitch? It looks great. I like how the orange really pops. It's not too much. It's just, it's amazing on, on what Mother Nature can create here with not a, a, a ounce of stain and all the different colors. It's really amazing. I, I agree. I, I, I never was a big fan of purple, but this purple heart wood, <laughs> it's got me sold, man. I, I can't wait to see what it looks like with the epoxy on there. Yeah, me too. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna take these boards, we're gonna brush our regular stone coat countertop epoxy on each of these pieces. We're gonna mock it up, we'll squeeze it together with our bar clamps. We'll get everything pretty square on the ends. We're gonna come and cut those ends after it's all dry anyways, but we're gonna pound down this and, and we'll get it all nice and tight, get it all clamped up, and that's why we have plastic. You know, you can put bar clamps underneath and, and rotate them, but because we have a really flat table and pretty big feet on our bar clamps, we're just gonna do them all from the top. That way we don't get epoxy that drips on our bar clamp that we have to pop off later. So we're gonna go ahead and get all this uh, epoxied up and clamp together and we'll let it sit. Let's get started. You ready, bud? I'm ready. All right, here we go. Okay, we've got some part A and part B of our regular stone coat countertop epoxy mixed up. We're just gonna use our chop brush and we're gonna go through here and we're gonna brush uh, one side. We'll put it together. You can do both sides if you want, but one side is gonna laminate really well. This is like the best glue on earth and you'll find that out if you ever try to pull something apart that's been epoxied together. All right, so what we're gonna do is just brush this out, get a nice even coat on these boards and we'll, uh, we'll do each board down the line here and it will be a great, great adhesion. All right. Go ahead and get another batch mixed up. Yeah, get another batch mixed up and we'll uh, start on that end, Mitch, and we'll just keep going right down the line here. There we go. No biggie. We're 
now going to use our bar clamps and we're going to start squeezing this together. We're not going to crank it too tight until we take our board and our hammer and we'll start tapping these down to hold some of the crown down a little bit and then we'll, uh, we'll clamp it super tight and let it sit overnight. Let's do it. Okay guys, what we're doing now is we're putting these blocks in to hold our boards down. You don't want any cupping going on because of our bar clamps. So these are holding everything down nice and tight. We've taken some masking tape and we put it on the bottom side of the two by four because if we didn't, this is gonna glue to our wood. When we take these off, the, uh, the masking tape's gonna glue to the wood but the planer will plane that right off for us but we won't get tear out ripping the wood apart because the epoxy would bond those really, really well. All right, we're gonna go ahead and put this right here on the end. Mitch, I'll start and then you could, uh, we'll just get it loose and we'll both clamp it together. Because right now, this is raised a little bit off my deck and when we do this, it's gonna make it super tight. All right, you ready to go? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Boy, the epoxy now gives you a great idea of what this thing can look like when we're all said and done, man. What do you think? It's beautiful. What's funny is you still, you know, we had saw marks and all this wood and everything, and, and, uh, and it, it doesn't even, it's not even close to what it's going to look like, but it's still awesome. Yeah, I'm all the way down nice and tight to the deck. Me too. Perfect. And we got this semi... Um, straight here you know we we got all the boards pretty close so we don't have a bunch of waste when we cut this apart but get everything nice and tight yeah that's nice and tight good yeah yeah i'm not getting any movement out of those we have a little bit of lippage here and there but the uh the router jig is going to take care of all of that so we're going to let this dry we'll come back uh after this is all dry and we're going to start planing it We'll see you in a little bit. Okay guys, we've let this set up overnight. We're gonna start deep prepping it right now. We'll take all of our clamps off and we're gonna pop this up, remove the plastic. We'll have some tape that has stuck to the underside and, and things like that. But then we'll get this prepped to start leveling with our slab jig. Let's do this. Okay guys, we got all the clamps off and all the plastic off of our slab here. What you have to remember when you're using plastic, use three mil plastic or thicker. Don't use thin painter's plastic because it's going to tear as you really try to pull it off because it's going to have some adhesion, but a three mil gives you something to pull on and it won't tear apart and leave little strips for you. That's a good tip. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to set up our slab jig to the thickness of our actual slab. I'm gonna show you the distance right now of our jig versus our table. So what you see here is we have a very little distance between our table and the actual jig. And my router bit is about three quarters of an inch thick. And so we're gonna to need to raise this table up. Now I can adjust my router down, no problem, but our whole jig needs to come up so that it, it will give us some room. So I'm gonna use two by four runners right along this edge, and that's gonna give us the opportunity to lift our jig. If you have a really big jumbo slab, you can build that up whatever thickness you need as long as it's the same on each side. So if you wanted to do two two by fours because you had a really thick piece of wood, you were gonna go ahead and plane down. That's what you do. If you need more table space, rip those down to two by twos. Whatever you need to do just to, just to lift this up. Our, our uh, wheels only take up about one inch on each side so that you don't need very wide strips to lift this up. But because we got plenty of room on our ends, we're just gonna use regular two by fours to lift this up to the height we need. Let's do that right now. Okay guys, so now we have an uh, inch and a half lifted here on our runner. So our jig is actually going to ride up another inch and a half. So we have a lot of distance here between our slab and our router. Now I got a three inch planing, surface planing router bit. Whenever you hook this up, you want to make sure it's really tight. You don't want any vibration on this bit 
you're using a big router bit, so just be careful. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen my base. Let's actually get this through. I'll loosen that base. Don't ever do this while the router's plugged in. And now I'm just going to make sure my bit will hit, and it sure will. So I'm going to now find the low point on my slab so that we can set our router bit to that particular point. So what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that my bit, when I rotate this down, it will come down and hit the top of my table without extending my router too far, and that works really good. Now I'm going to pull it up off that surface, and I'm going to use a tape measure to find the low point of my slab. Is I'm going to just get a measurement here. So I'm 1 and 15 sixteenths there. I'm 1 and 15 sixteenths. Right there, I'm two inches. Let's just go down my slab and see how thick we are. There's two inches. There's, there's one and 15 sixteenths. There's two, it's pretty even, which it should be. We ripped everything down. But on a wood slab, you're gonna have more cuppage and things like that. Okay, now that we have our slab jig lifted up an inch and a half off of our deck, we're gonna set our planing bed. And we know that we're pretty even across this, so I'm gonna go ahead and just get, get an eyeball here, and I wanna be about an eighth of an inch up, so I can adjust this where my router is about an eighth of an inch off the deck, and we'll test that out, make sure we can plane everything down. I may, I may have to get a, go a little lower, but I can always go a little lower if I want to. All right, let's set this up. Don't ever set that while the router's plugged in. Always be safe. We're going to put our mask on, our ears, have eye protection. Let's go for this right now. Another thing you're going to want to check is make sure that your stop is going to stop your router bit from hitting your jig. And it sure will right there. We're set at a good spot. We're ready to go. Okay, here what we're doing is we're taking three quarter by three quarter inch steel bars. We've cleaned those with acetone. We've gotten them all ground down with our 50 grit metal sanding disc so that we get great adhesion. We're routering out pockets so that we can insert these steel bars and have them flush under our table. That's really important so that you don't feel them when you rub your hands and knees underneath your table. These steel bars, what they're going to do is they're going to reinforce this table so that it doesn't cup or warp. We're also using our semen crack fill to put these into the table. Our semen crack fill is very, very strong and it dries in about three hours and is sandable in about three hours. It's a great product to be able to embed things as well as fill cracks and crevices in your project. You're going to see that uh, be used a little later on in this project. You can also use a Bondo spreader to spread our semen crack fill to fill in these joints. When using our semen crack fill to embed these steel bars, pour a little bit of material in the routered out joint, put the bar in, and then simply add a little bit more material and use a Bondo spreader to make it flush. You can come back and check your work. You have about 15 minutes of working time to work with this. Okay, after the seam and crack fill has all dried, now we're ready to sand off the excess and remove all the marks from our router jig. We're gonna use a 50 grit metal sanding disc. We have a link to this on our site as well. This disc will get rid of these uh, grooves very quickly and removes a lot of material with ease. If you use a normal sanding disc, it's gonna take a much longer time and a lot more effort. This is a great tip and trick to really expedite this process. After the 50 grit metal sanding disc step is finished, we will progress to normal wood sanding disc. But right now, let's remove all of these grooves so we have a nice flat surface. 
At this time, we're going to use our T-square and give ourselves a nice straight line so we can cut the end so we have a really flush surface. We like to do two passes so that we don't run that blade all the way through at one point so we get a great cut. After cutting our end grain, we're going to use our 50 grit metal sanding disc to clean up that cut. Ready? I can't break this. Hold on. Let me do it right here. So because there's a little more epoxy, because these are bigger, it's a little harder, I'm going to break this apart. <clears throat> okay, so you can see that epoxy holds stronger than that piece of wood is holding. This is walnut right here, and that walnut split, not at the joint where the epoxy is, it's split on the wood. That is awesome. If you run a straight edge across this, you can see it is extremely, extremely flat. I'm going to turn this to another angle here. Go this way and cross it. How's that look? Perfect. So there's no high points, no low points. That makes a really great project. Okay, the next step that we're doing here is we're making a mixture of our semen crack fill. We're doing a one-to-one -one ratio, and we mix it for about two minutes. After we've mixed it, we add our thickener. The reason we're adding thickener is so that the uh, semen crack fill doesn't go all the way through these cracks and crevices. It thickens it up and makes a great paste. We add a little bit of our color here. We're doing our metallic bronze, but because these cracks are so thin, it doesn't jump out at you like a metallic color. It looks like a very natural deposit in this table. We're going to overfill these cracks and then we're going to come back after it's dried and sand everything flush and this really sets us up for our next step when we do our seal coat so that we don't have our seal coat dripping and and going through these tiny little voids so we've gone through our table and we've looked for any little pit or crack and we're just overfilling any of that now we are making a mess on our surface and that's okay we're going to come back and sand off all this excess right after this dries we like to use a Bondo spreader after we've applied our semen crack fill to make a nice flush joint. I need to point out also we have not done our finished sanding. We've only done our 50 grit sanding disc up to this point. Some of our favorite benefits to using semen crack fill is that it's zero VOC and it's fast drying. It's not going to hold your project timeline up because usually in about three hours it'll be tack free and ready to sand. Here we're going to use that 50 grit sanding disc and we used one on this entire project and it didn't clog up. We're ready to router the edges of our project now. We like to use a one quarter inch router bit on the top and a one eighth inch router bit on the bottom. This is a really clean look to your project. We also like to use a sanding disc by hand on those edges as opposed to using a power sander on the edges so that we don't deform that nice clean routered edge. After we've routed our edges, we're ready to use our random orbital sander and remove all of those initial scratch marks caused by our angle grinder and that metal sanding disc. Here we're going to start with a 60 grit sanding disc and we're going to move through 60 grit, 100 grit, 150 grit and we'll stop at 220 grit on our random orbital sander. We really take our time with that first pad, our 60 grit pad, to remove all of those swirl scratch marks. You need to do this so that when you wet out your surface, you don't see swirl marks coming through that epoxy. The epoxy is amazing and it will really bring the grain to life. But if you've left scratch marks from your low grit in your sanding, it's going to show through. So take your time and have fun. This is honestly one of the most relaxing parts of the whole project and it's also one of my favorite. Now we're ready to bring this project to life. We're going to do our first seal coat. We're going to mix up one ounce per square foot and we're going to pour it right on this wood surface. Now wood is a porous surface so if we were to start with a big thick flood coat all the air trying to escape this wood would cause stubborn bubbles in our project that we don't want. So we're going to start with a very thin coat and we're going to squeegee it on using a normal shower squeegee. When we pick our squeegee we don't like one with metal parts on it so that we don't risk scratching our finished sanded surface. So we're simply going to spread this epoxy out and we're going to work the epoxy towards the edges. When we get the epoxy towards the edges we're simply going to roll it over that edge using a controlled 
motion with our squeegee and we'll come back with our gloved hand and we'll rub it in the surface. As you can see here, we're just rolling a little bit of epoxy over that surface and then we'll come back and rub it in. It's a really fun part of this project because you get to see what this wood really looks like when you apply our stone coat countertop epoxy. It honestly brings it to life. All right, what we've done is we've done our first seal coat and now we're ready for our second seal coat. One thing I want to keep in mind is when you do your seal coats, you're not going for perfection. You would need a flood coat to have everything level out perfect. We're just getting the surface wet and you're going to see that some wood is more porous and soaks in the epoxy than other parts of the wood. So some of the alder has really soaked this in and so what we're going to do is sand this with 220 grit. We'll sand the edges, we'll sand the roundovers by by hand. Don't use your power sander on the roundovers because we don't want to mess up that perfect shape. We'll simply go through those first, sand them by hand, and then all the flat spots of the surfaces we'll do with our power sander. We'll get everything sanded, we'll wipe the dust. There's no need to use a solvent. We'll wipe the dust and we're ready for our second seal coat. Again, this is done with the same stone coat countertop epoxy that you're going to use for your flood coat. It's the same product, it's just applied much thinner when you do the seal coats. Here we go, let's do this. A quick tip for you is on your first seal coat, you're going to have bubbles and it's really going to show you where you need to concentrate and where you need to fill. Again, you're not going to be perfect and that's okay. Don't worry. Each seal coat, it gets better and better. It's like unraveling a Christmas present. So here I can see some divots and dips and, and nibs and nubs and those kind of things. So I sanded a lot of that off, but don't try to sand this perfect. Leave those imperfections. All we're doing is roughing the surface up. You don't have to get it perfectly flat each and every time. We're going to build these coats up. Also on our edges, if you do have drips, that's what you want to get rid of each time. You don't want to have bumpy edges, so use that power sander on the flat part of your edges and make those nice and smooth. And then when we proceed to the second seal coat, it's going to come out even better than the first. Let's get started. All right, we're ready to pour our second seal coat. Let's get started. Now, I'm not going to push anything over my edges just yet. I'm going to get what we call the field of the project. We're going to get the majority of the inside square footage and we'll just push it up towards the edges and then when we're, when we're ready to do the edges, we'll have plenty. We won't have wasted a bunch over the edge. Man, this really brings this to life. Okay, now I'm ready to push it over my edges. Let's go ahead and do that. Boy, look at that edge. So I'm just using those drips over the edge to uh, coat my edges. You're gonna, you, you don't need a lot of material on those edges, so you just push a little over, get it to start dripping, and then come smooth it on out. Keep that plastic clean, and then any epoxy that sits over that edge on the plastic, there's your reserve right there if you need a little bit more. 
So the final step of this seal coat is what we call mowing the lawn. We're going to start at one end and we're just going to do long strokes so that everything gets somewhat even. And then we'll go through and rub those edges one last time because we will be pushing some epoxy over the edge in, in different amounts. And so we don't want wavy edges. Let's do that right now. Now, you don't need very much torching on the seal coats. Uh, you don't want to try to remove the bubbles with the torch because you'll burn your wood. It still doesn't have a lot of protection from the epoxy. So we're just going to do a quick torching, but a quick tip when you use a torch is I may have some dust in this torch, so I don't want to start blowing this right on my surface. So I'm going to start off the surface, let it start, make sure there's nothing in that torch head, and now we're ready to do a quick torching. Using stone coat countertop epoxy on your projects is really easy to do as long as you have the right steps. Follow the steps that we're showing here in this video and you're going to get amazing results. We've been through the trial and error. We used to put on too thick of coats and we would get problems with air. Air would almost make it white and foggy in areas when it was really porous wood. So be sure to follow these steps. Do your seal coats until you're completely sealed. Once you're sealed, that flood coat is going to be magic for you. All right, well, we're going to let this dry. We're going to put our radiant heater in here, really heat this room up because we're going to do a seal coat at the end of the day. We'll get two seal coats done in one day. We'll see you in a little bit. Okay guys, we're ready for our third seal coat. Uh, we did our second seal coat about eight hours ago and it's dry pretty well, but there's still a little tack to that. It, it, it's still uh, very, very fresh. And because it hasn't been 24 hours, we can apply our third seal coat without sanding. If you're new at this, I always recommend waiting 24 hours, sanding between coats, wiping the dust and applying another coat. But because it's still tacky and we did this today, we can apply the third coat without sanding. We're going to apply this in the same manner with a squeegee. We'll let it dry and we'll be able to sand and do our flood coat tomorrow. Let's get our third coat on right now. All right, folks, we got our third seal coat completed. Uh, we did that the same way that we did the first two. We're going to let this dry overnight, and we'll come back, and we'll sand, and we'll apply our flood coat. We'll see you in a little while. Hey, we got our third and final seal coat all wrapped up here, and inevitably on a wood slab project, especially around knots and cracks or little stubborn areas, you'll get these little tiny bubbles that just never seem to fill up. They, they want to blow air out, cause a little bubble, and the epoxy doesn't sink down into that area. So I'm going to show you how to save yourself from these problem areas where you don't have to keep doing seal coat after seal coat. We use a, a burn-in stick. Uh, we actually have pieces of our, our burning stick. We use these all the time. They look like a giant coloring crayon and you can get them from a company called Mohawk. We have a link um, on our website to the actual burning sticks that we get. You can get whatever color you'd like and then this will fill these little tiny problem areas. We're going to sand these bubbles down flush, fill them with our burning stick and then sand that flush. After we do that, we'll sand this entire top with 220 grit sandpaper, and then we're ready for our final flood coat. Let's get started. So I got a bubble and some bubbles right here. We're just gonna fix these one at a time so we don't lose them out. We won't sand the whole thing. We'll just sand these problem areas and fill them and then move on to the next spot. So now here you can see these little pin dots that are voids in our surface and this is what we're looking to fill. This is exactly uh, what would cause you problems when you keep trying to seal coat. So we're going to use our burning stick to fill those right now. When using the burning stick just make sure you get it nice and hot at the tip and then you're going to rub it in like a coloring crayon.
Another thing I like to do is sometimes heat that up while it's on the surface and then just rub it one more final time so it really pushes in that little divot. What we're going to do is we're going to use a razor blade to get most of this burn-in stick off the surface and then we'll sand one final time with 220 to make everything almost invisible. Keep in mind when you're looking for bubbles, you can sand those off and you'll know real quick, was it a high point or was it a bubble? If it's a bubble, you'll remove the top and it'll become a slight divot. That's what you're looking for for the burn-in stick. So just use your sander as your friend. Take a few minutes before you do your final flood coat to really look for any problem areas and then you won't need to do another flood coat. We never want to waste epoxy, so that's why this step really helps in mitigating those problems. Okay, now it's time to remove our excess burn-in stick after we've filled our little divots. And what I like to do is heat it up and then take our straight edge razor blade and just remove the excess. It's really that easy. Now we're ready to sand the whole top after we've done this and take it down to 220 grit. Okay, now I'm ready to sand because I've got all my little pin dots filled and addressed and I'm ready to get this to 220 grit on the entire piece. We do 220 grit because that's a good mechanical bond. You don't need to go higher than that. It's going to hide all of our sanding scratches when we do our flood coat. What I'm going to do is use 220 grit sanding disc right here on the edge by hand and then I'll do the flat part of the edges and the surface with my random orbital sander. Let's get started. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to move our tabletop into another room that's a little less dusty. The reason we do that is so that we don't have dust falling into the surface of our brand new tabletop with our flood coat. Uh, when you're doing your seal coats, it doesn't really matter. These are never going to lay out perfect. In fact, you don't have enough epoxy at one ounce per square foot to level out. So you're going to get an imperfect surface. And that's what we have here. Now we're going to do our flood coat in our finish room and that's going to come out just awesome. Uh, if you don't have a finish room, you can use a PVC pipe structure that you can make and then drape some three mil plastic over that structure so that it doesn't touch your table, but it will stop anything from falling into it. It also traps the heat really well. All right, I'm going to move this and we'll get started on our final flood coat. We'll see you in a moment. Okay guys, we're getting ready to flood coat our project. We're just going to mix up enough material to have three ounces per square foot on this flood coat. We'll start with part B. We'll do equal parts, one to one ratio by volume, not by weight. We're going to do part B and then we'll add part A. Let's go ahead and mix this up. If you haven't seen our video on how to mix, go check that out. It's really simple. Just follow these few easy steps. Let's get started. Make sure your, uh, your surface has been wiped down with a paper towel. You don't need to use a solvent or a tack cloth. Just wipe any of the excess dust right off that surface and you'll get a great flood coat. It's also important to keep in mind when you mix your material, put your material in front of a space heater for a little while so that the, the epoxy will flow out really nice out of the containers. It's nice to have, uh, have it warm so that when you do trowel it out, it's not really, really thick like honey. It'll trowel really easy, just like we're about to show you. You don't want to leave your material in the bucket for a long period of time. If you do that, it's going to heat up and generate heat and you'll lose working time. You want to get it out on the surface and then you have all the time you need to get this bubble free. Here we go.
Now because I scraped the bucket into this mass of epoxy, I'll use my 1 8 inch square notch trowel to go ahead and move that around so that it all mixes really, really well. Now because we heated this up, it's moving really easy on our surface. So let's trowel this out. We're not gonna push it over the edges quite yet. We're gonna get the field all coated and then we'll come through and address all those edges very, very carefully so we don't waste any epoxy. The nice thing is, is if you take a little bit of extra time here, you don't need to mix up more epoxy than what you need because you won't be wasting it over the edges. Oh my goodness, look at this. <laughs> this is just, this is just beautiful. I love this project, I'm very proud of it. So I'm simply gonna go through here, use my square notch trowel to spread this out. The square notch trowel gets everything gauged at the right thickness so that it'll level out for me really well. Another thing to keep in mind with the square notch trowel is it's designed at this angle. So at this angle, that's about the angle that you want it when you're troweling out. So that's what you're looking for. You don't wanna turn your trowel really, really tight like this. You wanna keep it up at that same angle and you'll get the right amount of material on the surface. All I'm doing now is just using this little bead of epoxy to start rolling it over my edge. Come through here and get some excess. Just gonna start addressing this back edge before I move on to the front edge there. And I'm just rolling enough over the edge so that I could come back and brush that in and get it nice and even. So now we're just gonna chop out any of those trowel lines and this also helps to mix the material one final time. When mixing like this, you don't get any sticky spots in your surface because you basically mixed it three times. You mixed it in the bucket, you mixed it again using that trowel, and finally using this brush. When we do this, it looks like you're just really dimpling and ruining that surface, but we're so new in the working time, it's gonna level out great for us. And I'm just doing a random pattern, chopping this out, helping it mix, removing any trowel marks, and then I'll start addressing my edges and start torching. When you torch, you wanna to torch at least three times and really look at those bubbles. When you look at those bubbles, you'll see that you get the majority of them out with the first torching, but you don't wanna focus that flame on the same place for a long period of time. Come back in about five minutes, torch it again, and then finally torch it a third time. Okay, I got a bunch of bubbles in the surface from mixing and chopping and troweling. Now we're gonna start our torching process. We just use propane with a good burns o -matic torch head. You wanna get one that has holes in the neck so that when you turn it upside down, the flame doesn't go out. We have a link to this product as well on our product page so you know exactly what torch we're using. Let's go ahead and pop these bubbles and we're gonna do it three times. Again, we're not trying to get it all at once. We're gonna do this three times. So just keep that torch moving in a nice steady pace. I pretend I'm hosing off a driveway with a hose about that pace. Keep in mind when you're torching, not to overlap over your plastic too long because you'll melt that plastic. That's a nice hot flame. So just be careful and be aware of your masking in your room so that you don't cause holes in your masking. Now what I'm gonna do because it's torched our first time is I'm gonna go address those edges, but this time I'm not gonna roll my brush over the surface. I'm gonna keep it right on that uh, router edge and just do those uh, edges with really long strokes. Ok, 
Okay, let's torch this a second time. Here we go. Boy, this is laying out like a sheet of glass. We're just gonna torch it one more time and then we're gonna walk away and we'll be all said and done. Here we go. Hey guys, we like to wait a few days before we actually install our legs. So we'll come back in about four or five days. We'll flip this over and we'll show you how we install our legs and remove the drips with our 50 grit metal sanding disc. We really hope you enjoyed this video. We had an absolute blast making this project. I can't tell you enough how these colors glow. The, the pictures don't do it justice, but the pictures still look pretty dang good. I, I just can't believe how this came out. I'm very excited about it. Oh, I can't wait to use this table. Please comment below. Let us know what kind of project you'd like to see next. Would you like to see a three-dimensional piece of driftwood get coated so you learn how to do these 3D objects? Or would you like to see another river table with a new technique? You let us know below and we'll get it out as soon as we can. Again, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching this video all the way through. We appreciate it. If you enjoyed this content and it sparked some ideas and helped you out, please give us a thumbs up and like our video. Also, share this with your friends. That would be great. Just click that share button and feel free to subscribe if you haven't already done that. We put out the best content we possibly can on a regular basis. Feel free to call us anytime for free project support. We love helping our, our friends and, and our viewers and our customers. Please call us anytime for free project support. Uh, again, thanks for watching this video. And until next time, remember, from Stone Coat Countertops, you got this. All right, we'll see you soon.